The fundamental to understand microservices is that you understand how do microservices communicate because it lays the foundation of how the architecture is going to be and whether you are making a right choice by moving to microservices architecture or not. In this video, we are going to study the same. So let's get started. There are two types of categorization of different styles of communication between microservices, which are synchronous blocking communication and asynchronous non-blocking communication. Before we try to go into different implementation choices for these two types of communications, let's try to go over briefly the definition for synchronous blocking and asynchronous non-blocking communication styles. Synchronous blocking communication can be defined as when a microservice sends a request to another microservice and waits or blocks all the operations further until it receives a response from the another microservice. That means the communication is synchronous, it's waiting for the other microservice to send it a response so that it can move on with other operations. On the other hand, asynchronous non-blocking microcommunication as the name suggests itself is, the microservice sends some kind of data or events or request to another microservice and does not wait for it to respond. It might process the response that the another microservice has sent over the time, but it will not block any other operations in the meantime. Talking about synchronous blocking communication, we have one type of the implementation which is known as request response type of communication, which is implemented via REST over HTTP or RPC. This request response type of communication can also be used to implement asynchronous non-blocking calls. While for other asynchronous non-blocking calls, we have methods such as event-driven methods or shared databases. Event-driven methods can be implemented using topic-based messaging systems or queue-based messaging systems as well as RPC. Whereas for shared database, you have to depend on two databases or file systems. Let's try to look at it in more detail. These are the three different types of communication that we have just talked about. In request response architecture, we request the data over REST API or gRPC or RPC. We get the response, the process on the calling microservice either waits for the response and then once it gets the response, it continues. In case this is an asynchronous non-blocking operation, in that case, it will not wait for the response but will process the response once it receives from the other microservice. In case of event-driven architectures, we rely on messaging systems. Those can be queue-based messaging systems or topic-based messaging systems. And the third one is shared database. This is not a recommended approach, but we will see the use cases where it can be used. In this case, we have a common shared database between two different microservices. Now, let's start with an example for synchronous blocking communication. We have order service here and we also have inventory service here. The order service will send a request to get stock for an item and will not continue any operations until the stock items or the status of the stock is written from the inventory. This is a typical example of synchronous blocking. This can be done by, as we just discussed, request response, which can be implemented using REST APIs or RPCs. What is the advantage of this communication? Microservices can communicate with each other for the required data and they can collectively fulfill the business functionalities. However, there are also downsides to this approach. Let's say you have many services in the same scenario where order service sends a request to inventory. Inventory, in order to reply the data for this request, needs to call another service. And again, this operation is synchronous blocking, which also calls another service to get the data. Now you see that there is a chain of call created here and it can take a lot of time. There can be timeouts. And in this case, the synchronous blocking approach is not very useful. If we talk about asynchronous non-blocking, again, we have order service and notification service. In this case, order service sends an event. For example, customer has placed an order to the notification service. Notification service will attend to that particular event as per it's processing because order service is not waiting for the reply. But once notification service is done responding to that event or acting for that event, it will send a response to order service that I have processed this event or here is the reply, after which order service has to act upon that reply. This mechanism that I have described here is actually a request response implementation of asynchronous non-blocking. We'll come to the point how this whole situation is handled in event-based systems. The third type of approach that we have is shared databases. As you can see that there is a file ingester which is uploading a catalog file into the system. This database could be S3 or some other data store, but there are two different services which are reading from this database. 
Now this approach works as long as this communication is one way. What do I mean by one way? That file ingester is writing the data whereas other two services are only reading the data. As long as this communication constraint is fulfilled, it is fine. But the moment where both the services or more than one service start to read as well as write data, that is where the problem occurs. In that case, the shared database approach is not recommended at all. Another bigger use case of shared database is something like data lake, where different services are pushing the data and some consumer service which needs the data is reading from it. Again, if you see, the flow of the information is only one way. These three services are only writing the data and not reading the data. And this service is only reading the data and not writing the data. And in this case, this approach or this communication pattern can be used. But if you ever find yourself in a situation where there is a shared database, it could be any data store and more than two services are reading as well as writing to it. That means you have done a mistake in implementation and you should consider alternate approaches. Now let's move on to the event-based communication. In event-based communication, again, it is also asynchronous non-blocking, but it is slightly different from request response. Let's see how. We have order service. There is a topic in a queue for which the status of the order is pushed. Now, these two services, notification or inventory or other services will consume that event, but order service will not wait for any response order service doesn't even know that what the other services are going to do with this event in fact it wouldn't even know that more than two or three services are consuming its event all the order service has to know is it has to push an event to a particular topic in a queue and then the other services or downstream services will react to it now the beauty and the advantage of this approach is that your systems become hugely decoupled because order service doesn't have to know the functionality of downstream services. Whereas in case of when we have looked at order service communicating with notification service on the basis of request response architecture, it somehow has to know about what notification service is doing because it is waiting for a response. So order service somehow has knowledge about a little bit of logic on the notification service or what it is going to do with the request. On the other hand, if we look at the event-based approach, order service doesn't even know that notification service is reading this message or reading this event. Yes, while the development is happening, the team and the developers will communicate with each other this, that yes, we are going to send this event and this will be the format of this event. But how the other services are consuming that event or what are they doing with that event or payload or the data inside that event, it is none of the orders concern. So that's why this is a beautiful architecture and it is used to scale the systems heavily. Of course, the downside is that it comes with huge complexity and the developers of the systems need to take care of it. I would be happy to make a dedicated video on event-driven architecture because it is not as easy as it sounds. Maybe we can do the next part on that. But in the meantime, what would your next question be? That which approach would you choose when you are working on microservices? There is no right or wrong answer. In fact, all the microservices architectures use a mixture of these approaches. They use event-driven plus request response plus shared databases and so on. It depends on their use cases and it depends on the complexity of the architecture. There are a few links in the description. Please do check them out. Till then, take care. See you in the next video.